seized. Now, imagine men walking back and forth behind the wall, carrying all sorts of vessels and statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials, which appear over the wall. Some of the passing men are talking while others are silent. This is a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. You'll see these prisoners are just like us. These prisoners see only their own shadows, or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the wall of the cave. So we get a heads up right off the bat who the prisoners represent. Us. Important. Notice he's not saying you. He's saying us. Of course, how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Uh, the shadows which are being carried around in front of the fire, they would only see the shadows, right? Certainly. And if the prisoners were able to talk with each other, wouldn't they believe that they were talking about what was actually in front of them? About the shadows being projected onto the wall? They would have to. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side. Wouldn't the prisoners believe that when one of the passerby spoke, that the voice they heard came from the shadows on the wall? Nothing else by Zeus. I love that reaction. That's like saying, by God, yes. He seems awfully excited by that answer. To them, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. They would believe that the shadows were the real world. They would certainly have to be. So far, so good. Give me a volunteer. Good. Come on up. Stand over here and face the wall. And no matter what happens, do not turn around. Move a little bit forward. There you go. Stay right there and don't move. If, don't care what you hear. Don't care what you think is about to happen to you or how terrible you think it's going to be. Okay. All right. I'm going to take What's that? I'm going to take <laughs> We got a couple of people here. Uh, let's get any names. What's this guy's name? <laughs> yeah, I can see the resemblance. <laughs> What's his name? Lana <laughs> Jose. Jose. All right, yeah, Jose right here. And we need a name for this dude here. That's <laughs> We're getting closer. John. John. Oh, that's cool. Nice to meet there. So we have Jose. And we have John. All right. So what's this guy's name? Jose. Okay, this one? John. All right. All right. So who is this guy? Jose. You guys can see him. Who is he? Jose. All right, that's Jose. And then you've got John. Right? So you've got and John. All right. Your turn. My turn? Your turn. Who's this? Okay. Oh, interesting. And who is this? Yeah, you tell me. John, who's this? So sad. I mean, they're not going to kill you. They're just asking. They're just showing, they're just showing up in your world, man. Are they? You see any differences at all between the two of them? Oh, one of them has something on the leg. Okay. So which, so which one has the thing on his leg? The one on my left? Yeah, so what's his name? John? Okay. <coughs> John. All right. Who is this Thank <laughs> you. 
So far, so good? Yeah. Alright, you can turn around now. You can turn around now. Ah. Who's this? Dom? Hmm. Who's this? Is this John? You sure? I mean, that's the one I named John. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> his name. He kept it consistent, and this one is? Jose. Okay. We're going to sit down. Who was who? <coughs> you follow? Wait, who was who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is John. Oh. And then this is Jose. Hey. And so you notice that he recognized that there were little things, some, some, you know, like uh, Caesar Mo pointed out that uh, Jose's softer. John's a little bit thinner. Um, you notice that he has the, the, the holster on his side here. I think what you were probably looking at to differentiate them and sort of pop up. Christian yeah. at first he was a little bit confused, but after a while he got pretty good at the shadows. He was able to name them. He recognized them. Just based off of their shadows. But then a funny thing happened, did you notice? That when, he, when he turned around, he didn't you know which one was which. He struggled to it. He was like, oh, is that oh, am I right? Even when he goes to sit down, he's like, is that right? I don't know if that's right. Yeah. You know? Uh, the point is, is that as soon as he sat down, I'm sorry, as soon as he turned around and he saw the object itself, the real thing, well, it wasn't so clear anymore. Hmm? Yeah, but he got pretty good at identifying the shadows. Does this make sense so far? Okay. Now he says, imagine what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released from their chains. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled to stand up and turn his neck around and walk toward the light, he'll suffer sharp pains. Not only will his neck hurt, but the glare will hurt his eyes, and he'll be unable to see the shadows. So now imagine, he says, what happens if that person who's chained up is forced to turn around, and they encounter the light. It's going to sting their eyes. It's going to hurt. They're going to have trouble now recognizing the shadows because their eyes are getting adjusted to the, to the brightness. Now, real quick, important point. Remember, what does the light represent? Truth. Truth. Knowledge, wisdom, yeah, these things. So metaphorically, this person who's living in darkness turns, sees the light, and it, you know, sees the, uh, the truth, and it, it blinds them. It hurts their eyes. Further, he says, imagine this teacher, uh, I'm sorry, now imagine someone, a teacher, saying to this person that what he has been seeing his entire life was an illusion. But now that he has been freed and is walking toward the fire, his eyes turn towards the real world and he's now able to see things as they truly are. What do you think he'll say? Further, imagine that his teacher is pointing to the objects as they pass over the wall and requires him to name them. Won't he be confused? Will he not believe that the shadows he formerly saw are truer than the objects his teacher is showing him? So maybe we should have done that. It would have been interesting to you to, you know, once we're showing him the real objects, he turns around and sees them. He's like, wait, is that Jose? Is that Jose? Wait, is that John? To have him turn back around and then put them back up on the screen. I imagine it would be easier right off the bat to identify the shadows than to identify the object itself, the real thing. You follow? So this is the idea. If you turn and you see the truth, sometimes you know, it, it blinds us, it hurts our eyes, but it also we don't really recognize it when we see it. True, he says. So far true. And if he's forced to look straight at the light, will he not have a pain in his eyes which makes him turn away back to the objects that are easier for him to see, such as the shadows? and which will be easier to look at than the objects in which his teacher wanted him to look. So now he has a choice. He's looking at the, the light itself, or he can turn back and look at the shadows. And he says, won't it be easier for us to turn back and to look at the shadows? Because well, it's more comfortable. You know, if that light is hitting your eyes and if the light blinding, is blinding you, well, geez, it's just more comfortable not to stare at it. You know? Someone last period was using the following example. Um, you ever, you guys wake up in the middle of the night and you go to the bathroom? Any of you guys, when you go to the bathroom, you keep the lights off? 
but maybe you know your place well enough that you can like walk with your eyes closed. Yeah. Um, when you get back to bed, how long does it take you to fall back to sleep? Usually. Maybe. Now, any of you guys, when you wake up to go to the bathroom, you flip on the light, and you flip on the bathroom light. What happens to your eyes? Yeah, it just hits you. Now, how long does it take you to go back to sleep when you get back to bed? A bit longer. You know? In other words, the reason that we don't turn those lights on is because you know that the light's going to wake you up. In the same way that, that being hit with the truth, it wakes you up. And once you've been hit with the truth like that, it's very difficult to go back to sleep. It's difficult to go back to bed. You know, sleep in this metaphorical sense. And so, we keep the lights off. Once he's been hit with this, with this light, he has a choice. He can turn back towards the, towards the wall, but it's still going to be painful because he's going to be aware of something else. And even if he shuts his mind off, like, oh, don't want to see it, don't want to know about it, nope, 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 you're still aware that's there because someone's hit you with the truth. One of the reasons that if someone says something true to us and it stings us, we might say, that's not true, but you know how it bothers you over time? You know, if someone says something about you that isn't true, you probably can forget about it pretty quickly. But if it's, if it's, if it's a criticism, and we know it's true, and if, you know, it, can, it can sting for a long time, man. And then it's difficult to go back to sleep after that. Pretend like we don't know. And imagine once more, you're right, that he's reluctantly dragged up a steep ascent and is forced into the presence of the sun. Is he not likely to be angry, irritated, and won't his eyes hurt even more? When he gets closer and closer to the light, will he not be able to see anything? As he will not be able to see anything outside of the cave. Now, this is an important thing here. He's being turned and dragged. He's being forced out physically. Now, very few of us are, are, are physically dragged up and forced to see the truth about something. But there are ways in which we're forced to see the truth. Um, in the video we watched the other day, remember the, the, the scene where the... the when we go to talk to the guy, and he's using the Socratic method on her, mm -hmm. breaking apart what she's saying. Yeah, he didn't physically go up and drag her out. I mean, she obviously went to him, but if he, had, if he was just walking around on the street and engaged her in a conversation, that's very much like what Socrates did. He engaged people in these conversations, so, oh, you know what, what, what knowledge is, yes. Oh, wonderful, we're trying to figure out what knowledge is, and then tears it apart this way. Now, that isn't Socrates dragging somebody forcibly out, out of a cave, literally, but he's doing it metaphorically. He's, that, that person is, going, is in the middle of the night, they're going to the bathroom because they don't want to wake up, so they, you know, they keep their eyes closed or whatever, and then that's Socrates waiting for them in the bathroom and flipping on the light, you know, surprising him, hey! You know, and then the person scares you, like, what are you doing in the bathroom? And then the light's blinding you, and now try going back to sleep. It's going to take you a few hours, you know? You know, you'll, yeah, you'll be in bed like, God damn, Socrates. <laughs> you know? It's going to bother you for a while. And that's kind of like what this is. This person is being dragged up. It's Socrates assaulting your senses by asking you questions. This is why people who, at, who you know, we get hit with these like, deep conversations out of nowhere. If it bothers us, this is one of the reasons why. You know? Because it's not immediately. He, he, would, he would need to get used to the light. Exactly. His eyes would need to adjust to the sight of the world outside the cave. First, he'll see the shadows best, the shadows of the trees, buildings, and so on. Next, he would be able to see the reflection of objects in the waters. Then he'd be able to look at the objects themselves. Finally, he'll be able to gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the heavens. Won't he be able to see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun by, um, or the light of the sun by the day? Certainly. Last of all, he'll be able to see the sun. And not mere reflections of the sun in the water, but rather he'll see the sun in its proper place and will contemplate the sun as it truly is. So now again, if enlightenment, I'm sorry, if, if light rep in, in, represents enlightenment and truth, then we're thinking of the sun then as being kind of this ultimate expression of that. You know, like the sun is like the truth, we might say. And then hopefully you're now connecting those, those metaphors where the fire inside of the cave is just an imitation of the sun. That's the real thing. You know, the things that you see inside of the cave, the shadow that you see on the wall, is just it's an imitation, it's an outline of, of Jose, who he really is. And it's an outline of, of John, who he really is. If you get to see the actual object itself, you're going to notice, oh wow, there's a lot of differences between these two guys. 
You know, if you're just looking at the shadows, the differences seem to be their shape. You know, this guy's a little buffer and rounder. This one's got the, you know, a little leaner. He's got the holster. But other than that, not a lot of differences. But as soon as you look at the actual objects themselves, you see, wow, there's a big difference between these things. Just like people, man. If we get so caught up on looking at people, you know, just looking at the shadows of them, essentially their physical appearance, whatever, we can make that mistake of thinking, wow, they're pretty much the same people. You know, they all look alike. They're pretty much the same people. But if you actually get down to the nitty-gritty of looking at the details of that person, talking to them about what they believe, why they believe, and what their experiences are, you're going to see that, you know, that, that minds, minds differ far more than faces, and that there are significant differences between people. So certainly, he says, won't the former prisoner then reason that the sun is what's responsible for the season and the years, and that's the guardian of all that's in the visible world, and in a certain way, the cause of all things which he and his friends in the cave have been looking at all these years? Certainly. He would first see the sun and then reason about him. And when he remembered his old home in the cave and how his fellow prisoners were still chained up in there, don't you think he'd be happy for himself because he learned the truth, and pity them because they were still staring at shadows, erroneously believing they represented the real world? Think about this, if, you, if, you, if you're somebody who, you, you learn something really insightful, something really interesting, and then, oh, okay, imagine you're the person here in this case, who's been pulled out of the cave. You know? What's your attitude towards the people who are still inside of the cave, the people who, who were the prisoners? And now you've gotten to experience this real world, and then you're like thinking like, oh, this is really cool. What do you think about the people inside the cave now? I'm asking. What's, your, what's our attitude towards the people inside the cave now? The, old, the, the people who are still in prison. Feel bad for them. I feel bad for them. Pity them. Yeah, because they're living under this under an illusion that, that we happen we happen to know is not true. You know? Have you ever met anybody? Well, think about it, what would you want to do then? Run back and tell them about it. Probably, maybe, yeah, maybe run back and tell them about it if it's that big of a deal. If you think like, oh my gosh, it, it completely changes the whole perspective on reality. They're living a complete lie. Let me go back and tell them. Um, any of you guys know people who have undergone like a religious conversion and now they want to tell you all about their new religion? Or someone who became a vegan? Same idea. <laughs> yeah. Same idea. They all want to come back and tell you, oh my, oh you're living this lie. I got to tell you all about it. Especially if it's that big of a deal to you. It's that life altering. And if you think it's improved your life that much, well, you're going to want to help other people because you'll want their lives to be improved too, if you care about them. You know? This is why, like I've said, if you're walking down the street and somebody comes up to you and starts talking to you about, about their religion or about their lifestyle or about their whatever, it doesn't mean you have to sit there and, and, and talk with them, but just understand where they're coming from. The other thing is, you know, hey, I've got this thing to completely improve my life. I'd I love to see you improve your life too. They're coming from a place of love. So it doesn't mean you have to sit there and talk with them about it, but just understand that, you know, before you, you know, kick them in the stomach or whatever. <laughs> so he remembers his old home, he remembers the fellow prisoners, and he says he, he, that he feels terrible for them. And that Glockin says, well, certainly he would feel terrible for them. And if the prisoners had contests among themselves to see who were the quickest to observe the passing shadows, and to name which of them was on the wall, and which came after, and which would come next, and who were therefore best able to predict the future, do you think that the former <coughs> prisoner would care about winning the contest? Or do you think he would agree with the poet Homer, who wrote, better to be the poor servant of a poor master and suffer, rather than think and live like them? And that's an important thing there. You know, the, the, the poem he's quoting from there, the idea is that what, who's lower... Who's lower than a, than a slave? Slave, slave? Yeah, slave, slave. Yeah. So who's lower than a rich man's slave? Poor man. Poor man's slave. Yeah, so he's essentially saying, man, I would rather be the slave of a poor man, in other words, the lowest of the low, rather than think and live like them. In other words, I, if, I, if I had to be like them, I'd rather just be the slave of a poor man. That's the idea, is that even if, you know, if you understand that, that what, is ha what, the what the world really is, if you understand what truth really is in the broader sense, in the metaphysical sense here, then even if it costs you everything, it's like, that's fine. 
I'd rather, I'd rather live the truth than to live the lie like these people. As happy as they might seem, I'd rather be miserable knowing the truth rather than be happy under a lie. But again, it's worth considering if that's true for me. Yes, I think he would rather endure anything rather than base his life on something he knows isn't true. Now imagine once more that the former prisoner is put back into the cave. Wouldn't he have difficulty seeing in the darkness because his eyes were acclimated to the light? To be sure. He got used to the light, and now it would be difficult to see in the darkness. Interestingly enough, if someone entered him into that contest before his eyes readjusted to the darkness, wouldn't he look like an idiot because he couldn't name the images on the wall? People would say that, that he went out of the cave, that he came back without his eyes. They'd make fun of him because he couldn't recognize the shadows anymore. Wouldn't they say it was better to not even think of going out of the cave? Wouldn't they believe it was better to stay inside the cave? And if the teacher tried to unchain another prisoner and lead him up to the light, wouldn't they accuse him of trying to ruin their life and even try to kill the teacher? <coughs> so what he's getting at here is, so imagine now that prisoner has been, has been released, you know, the former prisoner, sorry, he goes back into the cave because he wants to tell everybody about it, and he walks in and they're having a contest. All right, let's see who can name him first. Uh, Who's this? Chocolate. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, stupid. You thought it was John. <laughs> All right, okay. Who's this? It's John. Oh, you're right. It's John. No, it's stupid. No, Jose. Now, imagine if you're that person who went out of the cave, and, and all you see is the shadows. You're like, I, I don't know. I don't, who is that? <laughs> you're stupid. You thought it was Jose, not John. Yeah, but I'm looking at the real thing right here. This is Jose. No, we're looking at the real thing. No, I'm looking at the real thing. Shut up. You can't even tell what the real thing is. You, you get someone else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but you're going to win the fight because they're in chains. They can't move, remember? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, just use them as a heavy bag, you know? <laughs> but the point is that when it, if, if those people thought that you were stupid, like, oh, you're stupid, you don't know what to say, would that really bother you so much? Yeah. yeah. Probably, maybe, probably not so much because you don't care about all this stuff up here. What you care about is what's happening on the, on the other side of the fire, what's happening with enlightenment. In other words, you aren't going to care anymore about those stupid, silly things that most people find important. Because they find, a lot of times we find things important because we're not enlightened. If we were enlightened, we wouldn't find those things nearly as important. You know? It's an assumption, but what those things are, that's up to every individual. You know, the things of your earlier life might not matter so much once you see the things of the, of, of the next life. And I just mean that like later on in life, like once you know better. You know, it's amazing. <clears throat> I don't know if, you, if any of you guys sit back and think about the kinds of things that were important to you when you were seven, you know? You look back at those things and go, oh my God, I can't believe that mattered to me when I was seven years old, you know? I have a, a, a friend who who's, has a daughter that she's in high school now, but she used to watch Dora when she was a little girl. And I've known them this long, and so I remember the little girl walking around, like, Boots the monkey? Ooh, Boots the monkey? She's all excited, oh, Dora! Now if they mention Dora to her, she's like, oh my god, I was never into Dora that much. You know, so, and, which by the way, if you have a big family, big Mexican family, you know one of the worst things you can do is let on that you're being annoyed by something? Because <laughs> then what happens? Yeah, yeah, what's up, Dora? Hey, you doing want to watch Dora? Now every time they get to her, they're making fun of her. About, about, about her, her fascination with Dora. So of course it make, makes her not want to go, but then they're like, oh. I asked them, didn't, that, didn't you guys do that to each other when you were growing up? And they're like, yeah, screw it, you just gotta learn. That's what you do. You make fun of family members. <coughs> but anyway, she's embarrassed about something that she was watching 10 years ago. You know? And then imagine in 10 years what she's gonna look back on and realize, oh my God, I can't believe I thought that was so important. Now imagine if rather than just having a shift in opinion, you have a shift in, in existential experience where now you absolutely know that there's something that's significantly more important than the things that we're pursuing right now in life. And then, and, yeah. Yeah, and then you can look back and go, oh my God, can't believe I wasted so much time you know, pursuing these things that were not important. And that's all lost time on pursuing the things that were important. Whatever they are, once you figure them out, you know? Um, and that's what he's getting at, that's what he's talking about. Now, I like the image here where he's talking about going back to the cave and trying to explain things. Um, let me think of an example. Mm. I 
an example. Um, we're going on a field trip. We're gonna we're gonna rent a helicopter. It's gonna have to be big, so we're already have to on to it. And we know a pilot who will not fly in the fog. <laughs> and what are we gonna do? We're gonna go down to Brazil in our helicopter. Uh, have any guys ever heard of those uncontacted tribes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, down in Brazil, there's about 30 of them now. Essentially, they're tribes of people who have never been contacted by the outside world. In fact, they don't even know that the outside world exists. Um, Brazil has very strict rules about these places where like, planes are, are, like, aren't even allowed to fly overhead because then they're going to look up and go, what is that? You know, it's, 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 of course, that messes up their culture, messes up the people. So these are folks who have all lived there for, for thousands of years and have never experienced a world outside of their little group right here, you know? It's a terrible thing because they're doing, you've heard I'm sure about the logging that happens down there when they go there and they cut down trees. They've encountered a bunch of, un of uncontacted tribes and then, of course, wiped them out because that's what they do. And these are people who had no idea that the, that the outside world existed on Monday and then they're all getting wiped out by Friday. And you can imagine what, what kind of a cultural shock this is when you hear the machines coming at them. But there's about 30 of them now still that are preserved, that, we, that the, the government knows that they're there, they're not, people are not allowed to fly overhead, all that. And then they carry on their life. Um, so we're gonna get a helicopter, and we're gonna go take one of them. We're, yeah, we're gonna land in the middle of a, of, a, of a village. We're just gonna grab the first guy we find, pull him onto the, the helicopter. Um, who's our big guy? Uh, Caesar. Caesar. Yeah, choke him out for us, would you? <laughs> just hold the guy and just put him to sleep, you know. And then when he goes to sleep, little M99 him, whatever. And then we're gonna get him out of that place. Imagine what, what are the villagers gonna say happened? How are they gonna describe this? Big bird came. Big bird came. <laughs> yeah. The gods are after us. Yeah, the gods are after us. Something, you know, the gods, what do the gods look like? Well, they look different. <laughs> They're looking at all of us, and we're all just, the gods are a motley bunch. They look like, they look like a bowling shoe all thrown together. And they won't even know how to, how to describe all of us, you know, as we got off this helicopter. And they wouldn't even know how to describe the helicopter because they don't have words for those things. Remember, even ethnically, they're all the same. So they're not going to have words to describe the diversity of ethnicities that are in this room. They never experienced it before, or our clothing, especially, or whatever. So we're going to get that guy out of there, and then we're going to fly him back to the states. Thank you for a year. What's that? Thank you for a year. Oh, we're going to keep him longer than that. He's got to learn English. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take him to Costco first. <laughs> you know, so we're going to land the helicopter in, in Costco. We're all going to get out. We're going to wake him up, and the guy's going to get up, and he's going to... Now, imagine if he's on this helicopter, he's looking around, and he sees all of us, like, surrounding him. Hi! <laughs> Welcome to America! And then we're going to, get him, we're going to help him, we're going to get him off the helicopter, and he gets down onto the, onto the parking lot. Now, how does he describe the parking lot? Hot. Hot, maybe. What's it, what's it look like? Black. Black. Black? White stripes. White stripes? Filled with machines, but he, don't, he doesn't have experience with machines. He doesn't have experience with, with tar or concrete. So the most he can say is black. You know, it's, it's hard, I guess. Coarse. What's that? Coarse. Coarse, maybe, if they have a word for like coarseness on his feet. Maybe they can describe the white stripes. But if he, if he describes all of that, and I asked you, what's he experiencing? Most of us would probably go, I don't know. Anxiety. Yeah, it was black, he's got white stripes, who knows? Is it an album cover? None of us would know what he's talking about. So imagine now, because you know, he doesn't have the ability to put those things together in a way that would make sense to us. So now we take him inside Costco. You know, someone's got a membership, yeah? Someone's got a membership? Someone help us out? Okay, as long as one of you do, yeah, we're all with him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, this, this guy too. <laughs> so we bring him in with us, and as soon as he walks through, he, he runs into a woman who sees him and asks him, would you like to try a corn dog? <laughs> and hands him some food. <laughs> oh, oh, Joe, oh, chill, chill, chill. Ah, uh, uh, uh. And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, oh, uh. <laughs> So he's entrusted, so we all take a sample first. <laughs> all of us, they open up more boxes of it and make more. But then we eventually he gets his, 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 so he tries it, and he's like, oh, that's weird. The world he's from, do people just hand you food? <laughs> Especially hot food? No. Yeah, this is completely new for him. Now imagine if he had to describe what it is that he sees inside of the Costco. You see the problem. 
He doesn't have the language to describe it. He can give us some language that approximates it. Like he can say, uh, like a hut. Okay, so it's like made of like, ba like oh, not bad, but like, you know, straw and tree hut. No, it's almost like the same stuff in the parking lot. Is it the same stuff as the parking lot? No, it's dramatically different. Parking lots, tar, and whatever it is, they used to make parking lots, and then the walls, though, of the, of the Costco, they're concrete, they're stone, they're not, they're not anything like a parking lot, but if you don't have other words, maybe you can say that they're similar, you know? It's not exact, but it's an approximation. And then, finally, we leave, and then uh, he, he likes the idea that he gets food, you know, whenever he wants it, so he chose us, so we said, let's just keep him for a while, let's do an experiment, long-term experiment. We're going to keep him around. around. We keep him around. Eventually, we teach him English, we get him some education, takes to it very well, smart guy. He ends up, we, we get him into a university. Yeah, he performs very well. He's in the Harvard. That's messed up. Take, take, him, take him back, that's messed up. What? That's horrible. We got a surprise for you. He has a surprise. That's terrible. Well, give me a minute. So, we're going to put him through college first. And you do exceptionally well. Let's say he. Let's say he becomes a lawyer. He goes to law school, top of his class, and you know everything's great. The guy speaks English. Everything is wonderful. He, he even we, we even get him to the point where he's so successful that he's pissed off about immigrants coming here, <laughs> and, and, and and doesn't see the irony of it. <laughs> and then one day he's he's walking out towards his car. Beep, beep, turn, you know, he's got his BMW, so he opens the key. And then when he does that, we jump him. <laughs> All of us, you know, out of the out of the out of the, uh, the bushes. Well, he, we, he would. He, the guy hasn't been in a fight in a long time. He, he, just, he's never, he hasn't had to, because that's not a civilized thing to do. So he's completely unable to defend himself. So before, this warrior, who would have been a warrior, you know, we jump on him, he just kind of goes, ah! <laughs> and he gives in. So we grab him again. So he's been working out for the last 10 years or so. Just, <laughs> and just, you know, once again, M99, throw him back on the helicopter, and we fly him back to Brazil. And yes, we drop him back off. Land in the village. What do the village people do? No, the villagers are not the village people. But the villagers, what do they do? It's here again. Yeah, it's here again. Man, they took so and so last time. Scatter! <laughs> <laughs> they all run away. We land. We, yeah, we roll their dude out of the helicopter. Not even drop off his. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, yeah, not even let him out. Just, it, like, we didn't even know the guy. Just, you know, just him out. done. <laughs> roll over. Boom, hits the ground. And then we, we fly away. <laughs>